My name is Dipti Desai and I, along with Vineet Patni and Jesse Danjal, co-chaired the Thai Global Health Initiative. This initiative was envisioned and brought to life by Venk Shukla, a Thai Global Trustee and past president of Thai Silicon Valley. For those not familiar with Thai, it was formed about 28 years ago to foster entrepreneurship amongst the Indian population. Professional graduates seeking jobs in the US were well versed with technology, but not with business. And they were hitting a glass ceiling. Thai provided a platform for them to start their own companies, become CEOs, get mentored, educated and funded, and allowed them to network with like-minded individuals. Today, CEOs and CIOs at many large enterprises are of Indian origin, thanks partly to the efforts of Thai. Thai is now a global organization and a brand with 60 chapters across the world and a large presence in US and India. The mission and vision of Thai Global Health is to bring together charter members from around the world that have an interest in health tech. Thai Global Health provides a platform that facilitates dialogue and interactions, exchange of knowledge and ideas, showcase technology, and bring together investors, innovators, and enterprises. We would like to use this forum to study the innovative solutions from startups, understand the gaps from enterprises, learn where the money is flowing through investors, provide knowledge through mentors and advisors, and use the collective connections to create a heightened momentum, which can be tapped for the greater good for investing, mentoring, advising, and showcasing of ideas. Our session today is centered around health assurance, and it is my honor and privilege to introduce you to Hemant Taneja, our speaker for today. Hemant is the Managing Director at General Catalyst and is the author of a newly released book, Unhealthcare. Hemant has the Midas touch, truly. He has made a series of very, very successful investments. He has that inner magic to spot unicorns early on. And some of his investments include Color, Grammarly, Livongo, Samsara, Stripe, ThoughtSpot, and the list goes on. He's also the founder of Comure, which is building a much needed software platform to transform the healthcare space. His investment thesis is based on the economies of unscale, focusing on helping startup founders leverage AI-based personalization to innovate across sectors. This was beautifully articulated in his book, Unscaled, which was published in 2018. His new book, Unhealthcare, is a must read, and you'll hear a lot about it from him today. If you've not picked it up, you must do so. I feel it has some amazing nuggets of information. It's available on Amazon in a digital or a physical format, and it clearly lays out the thesis for how the healthcare system needs to transform into a health assurance system and outline some new business models that are coming into play. By now, you must know that Heyman's is truly an overachiever. I was at Stanford, but my dream school was MIT. That is where Heymanth went. And he didn't get just one degree, but I believe he got like about six of them. To me, there is a term in healthcare that we use to describe this phenomena. It's called totipotent. These are stem cells that can develop into any type of cell. Heymanth clearly exhibits multi toti potential, which means he can do anything he can be anything, and often at the same time in parallel. His curiosity about new areas of innovation has brought him to this stage of his life where he's brimming with success stories. And today, we are all very lucky to hear from him. The session today is a conversation between Hemant and Carolyn Savello, VP of Commercial at Color. Color is a population health genomics company in which Heymanth is an investor and a classic example of health assurance in action. What Color has been able to accomplish illustrates how health assurance companies can transform healthcare. Carolyn leads the company's go-to market strategy and the commercial team. She helps Color build partnerships with institutions around the world. 
She joined Color from Bloomberg, where she was the chief of staff and global health of strategy, and subsequently GM for Bloomberg Media. Carolyn began her career at BCG Consulting Group with Fortune 100 biotech companies and Gates Foundation. She's a graduate of Yale. We want this to be an interactive session. So as you're listening to the conversation, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I will meet you again at the end of this fireside conversation between Caroline and Heyman, and we'll be back to lead the Q&A discussion. I would now like to hand over to Caroline Savell to bring to begin this exciting discussion on health assurance with Heyman Taneja. Over to you, Carolyn. Well, thank you so much, Dipti. I really appreciate the, the warm introduction um, for Color and for and for Himan. Um, so Himan, let's start with the book because I think that's really the, the, the crux of the conversation here. Um, and I know it's been really, really well received. So tell us about the book, um, about healthcare in the US. You published it with Dr. Steve Clasco, who um, is also a, a collaborator of Colors as well. And he heads Jefferson Health in Philadelphia. Um, you introduced this concept of health assurance. Can you help everybody understand what you're talking about by that? And sort of, especially at this moment in time, what that really means to, to the industry? Yeah, so Caroline, I think you probably don't know this. I don't think I ever mentioned this to you, but the phrase health assurance actually came from me sitting in a color board meeting. Um, I didn't and, know that actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, what, what color does is preemptively figure out how to keep people healthier, right? At population level. And that's akin to us all creating our 401k, which is around your financial assurance as you sort of live, live a longer life. And, and that's when I started to think about this. Um, so the core um, philosophy behind health assurance is to build a 21st century healthcare system which first and foremost is refactoring the entire system in the context of consumer experiences. So one of the companies that we co-founded in our offices was Livongo. And in that company, we essentially tackled taking on consumers with chronic conditions like diabetes and figuring out what is the right consumer experience we can build to help them live their lives. And as it turns out, uh, you know, at the time when we started the business, there were probably 40 companies working on diabetes and every one of them had a design principle that were essentially based on if I can get the diabetic consumer to come into the app and enter all their data multiple times a day we will help them become healthier but when you think about it which consumer wants to think about their diseases uh, 10 more times a day nobody does you actually want a disengagement principle when you build that so I think sort of thinking about those consumer experiences first and foremost is, uh, is uh, what defines health assurance. The second, and this is hard for a venture capitalist to say, but is to actually reduce the healthcare market. Everywhere else we invest, we're talking about TAM expansions and how do market sizes get bigger. It's a collective obligation that we actually reduce uh, what it costs to enjoy health as a share of wallet, both for consumers and for businesses alike. So I think that's an important mindset. And the third um, uh, core principle behind health assurance is around the responsible use of data. So AI and machine learning to me is garbage in, garbage out. And when you think about a lot of the data that's being used in the healthcare systems, it was largely captured in the context of billing. I mean, they have this joke in healthcare that when uh, um, CPT codes change, diseases disappear. And so a lot of that data is actually not representative of the care. Uh, the actual conditions that the consumers might have. And so trying to use data responsibly in terms of digital interventions as we get more sophisticated in that regard, that's the third tenant of health assurance. So I, I, think, I think tech would agree with all of those statements. I think a lot of health systems, a lot of healthcare leaders may not. Um, how do you see that changing? And, and why isn't there more collaboration between tech and health systems and healthcare leaders? And, and how does that change? Yeah, it's, it's a great uh, comment, Caroline. So um, when I first met Steve Clasco, Steve, Steve for everybody's benefit, he's uh, the CEO of Jefferson Health. It's about a nine billion dollar health system in the greater Philadelphia area. And I mean, he's he's uh, this bold sort of visionary inside the health system that really wants to embrace technology and has made a lot of uh, a compelling sort of uh, forward-leaning moves. Um, you know, when I first met him. 
um, it was at a dinner I had hosted with a bunch of health system leaders around uh, the founding of Comir. And I, and I said to him, you are the thesis and the antithesis of my first book on scale. And he said, what do you mean by that? I was like, well, you, what I've seen you do in the last three, four years is go from two hospitals to uh, 14 hospitals. It was essentially applying economies of scale to become a viable health system. But on the other side, all your talks are about being healthcare with no address, which is essentially the whole notion of bringing care to the consumer and virtualizing it. And how are you really going to get there? And, and I think the, the reason um, you find, you know, you deal with this because you're selling to a lot of these health system CEOs that some of them just don't get it is because they're so mired in the challenges of becoming viable today that it's harder for them to think about where they need to go. I think that's the issue that hopefully this sort of technology and healthcare collaboration can make surmountable, uh, you know, over the next few years. Yeah, yeah, it, you're right. I mean, and I think Dr. Clasco, if anybody has been like very much at the forefront of, of that, um, I mean, one other thing that I, I think is really interesting is this moment in time and the timing of your book right now at this moment in time when the healthcare industry, I mean, globally is just gonna be completely upended. Um, can we talk about payers and, and where have they been in all of this and what does the future look like for them? Because I think that payer health system relationship is so, is so fraught now and has to change and probably is very much related to kind of where you're seeing the industry go as well. Yeah, the payer provider arbitrage is fascinating to me. There's so many companies in health that are, you know, are applying machine learning to, to facilitate this arbitrage, which frankly is not an area that we're interested in investing because essentially it's based on the premise that the payers think providers build too much and the providers think payers pay too little. And so it's all this machine learning on both sides to figure out how to you know, maximize uh, whatever their objective is. And, and you know, that just comes from, and you guys talk a lot about this as well at, at Color, is the, the fundamental issue is this, this incredible misalignment in this industry around who pays, who decides, and who benefits. Because of that misalignment, uh, this is actually one of the reasons why technology entrepreneurs have difficulty building a business in this market as well, because it's just not rational. Um, and, and I think the thing with the pairs is what started out as providing catastrophic insurance uh, for uh, uh, you know, unanticipated, unanticipated um, uh, healthcare challenges that might arise is now essentially become this integrated service where the pairs are also going deep into providing healthcare services in this misaligned system. And, and they often do that as a loss leader so they can you know, uh, get folks into the payer system. And that uh, model just doesn't really work. What you have to go uh, to is a world where um, uh, you have this health assurance mindset. You're literally investing in services that keep the populations healthy uh, and, and then you have an insurance product that is around catastrophic insurance. And this continuum today is, is part of, I think, what needs to uh, unbundle uh, in the next few years. Yeah. I mean, I, I think especially now with COVID. How would you deal with them? Like, what, what would you say? Yeah, yeah I, was, I, was, I was just gonna, gonna kind of comment on that because I think like with COVID right now, I mean, it's completely changing consumer expectations, I think of how they have to, how they operate vis-a-vis -vis healthcare. And, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of work with, with we we basically tried to restructure um, a lot of our product early this year to be able to kind of jump in and, and help with the pandemic. We'd been providing large scale population health services, including clinical genetic testing. And we had seen exactly the same challenges with the COVID epidemic and pandemic, which was you know, friction in the process for consumers and way too much overhead for providers. And if you could actually just change a lot of that, put a lot of that into software, you could totally change what COVID testing access looked like. Um, and, you know, I've talked to a number of people, uh, you know, in leadership positions across the U.S. health system since then, and everybody's just saying, you know, if you can drive down the street to a pier in San Francisco and get a COVID test without actually having to interface with a doctor, you know, if you get a text message when your results are ready from color saying, you know, you, you know, what your test result is totally changes your expectation of how you should, uh, what you should expect from your healthcare system and from your doctors on an ongoing basis. So like the cat's out of the bag, basically. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think the idea that you can build great consumer experiences, which is really what you're describing. I mean, it's entirely possible in this industry, right? I mean, um, when we started Livongo, just to give you um, a trip down the memory lane in 2013, 
sort of transforming this com consumer experience was, was a core uh, objective for us. And last year when we went public, we went with public with an NPS that was higher than Apple. And I think that that's a bit inconceivable uh, in the healthcare space that consumers can actually get that kind of a service. But it's largely because of that misaligned system. I think a lot of the work that you guys are doing and other companies are doing brings forth that, that same sort of consumer experience expectation into implementation that we're frankly, what you just described happens to us when we buy books from Amazon, right? I mean, it's like it, this 20% of GDP just has been lacking because frankly, tech has just left behind the sector uh, based on a series of decisions over the last 20 years. Yeah, yeah. And I think especially, I mean, as we were talking about earlier, especially with the sort of the, the misaligned incentives in the US healthcare system and sort of the friction introduced by payers in the mix. You know, it's interesting to see how different the healthcare experiences are in countries like Singapore, where, you know, color, you know, our team has spent a lot of time where it is really about how do you actually get people to engage much more directly and on a daily basis in preventative activities and taking care of their health. And that's something that really is felt deeply by the health system. It's not really optimized just for acute care um, as a result of the payers really not being in the mix in the same way. And I think that's actually something that really has kept away a lot of technology innovation here in the US. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, while we're at it, if you, if you uh, maybe we should just talk about, you know, the transformation you guys had to go through to seize the moment around COVID as well. I mean, I think just for the uh, the listeners' um, uh, benefit, we had this just like every other startup in April, March, April. You know, if it was it was just an awful couple of months because every board meeting you went to was all about what is the defensive strategy. How are we going to keep the the uh, employees safe? And what is the defensive strategy? Because we don't know what the world's going to look like. And you know, to, to give credit where credit is due, Caroline and Othman showed this incredible courage and they actually came and said, well, we're gonna increase investment and we're gonna go take on this problem, A, because it's a good, it's good for society and B, because it's good for business. And they sort of took their population health rails and went down the path of, uh, in, from, this, from scratch, setting up a COVID testing lab, getting FDA approved, and, and now in six months are one of the largest uh, testing platforms uh, in uh, in the country. Why don't you just talk through sort of what what you learn, what you guys learned from that process? And I know you haven't even had time to reflect on this because it's it's just in sort of this tremendous scale mode. But I think it could, it'd be good for everybody to understand the problems that got exposed that you had to overcome. Um, you know, to get us through this pandemic. Which, by the way, we should stop thinking of pandemics as a black swan. They happen every couple of years, and we have to engineer out the devastation with technology. So. So why don't you tell the story, Caroline? Yeah, well, well, first of all, I actually remember that board meeting back in April. Um, and if anybody is looking for an investor that is incredibly visionary and also extremely supportive of companies that are making bold moves, we are very lucky to have him on in that boardroom um, alongside us through all of this. It's been a, it's been a wild ride. Um, you know, I think like when we, when we, it really was kind of like a weekend conversation almost um, at the time. I remember on a Saturday night, a number of us in the company were thinking like, we actually have these things. We have these assets that we know we can deploy here. I mean, if ever, if you take yourselves back to March, late March, you know, um, no testing was happening. People, no. people were getting results by a nurse calling them if the nurse remembered and had time. It was the same nurses that were in ER rooms, you know, admitting people who were having breathing difficulty. Um, yeah, there was no testing happening and nobody knew what was going to, you know, everybody thought it was going to be like a four to six week thing. Um, and um, we, we basically in the course of a week, you know, repurposed the software that we had been, you know, using for large scale testing programs in other segments in clinical genetics, we had, we provide large scale genetic counseling services in the US and overseas and we basically repurposed that whole platform and put it to work with COVID testing. And our first partnership was actually with the city of San Francisco, um, where I live um, here in California. And it was about how do we actually change the access model for people to get testing? We set up testing site, but really it was around the software, as I was mentioning earlier, being able to get a text message with your results, which at the time back in March, I know it only seems like it was it was nine months ago, but was, was really different at the time. Um, and I think what we've seen over the past nine months is that, you know, at least in the US context, um, the public health system was so deeply ill-equipped to meet this challenge. And a lot of it was because of a lack of appreciation for an investment in software actually over the past decades. 
Um, and also because of just the fragmentation and the reliance on traditional healthcare to be providing these services. And they sort of started there, the public health system started there. And I think the role of public health is just changing very rapidly now in the US. And I, I assume overseas as well um, is happening uh, very rapidly too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so, so much got exposed in, in the last few months in terms of the lack of resiliency in the health system. I mean, I think the fact that we are just fundamentally missing this public health rails, if you will, the test, trace, isolate system that can use the, uh, the I guess the pun is intended here, the virality of social media to subdue the virality of the infections, you know, in terms of like the technology platforms we've built. I think that that whole infrastructure just needs to get created. And obviously you guys took advantage of um, some of that and others have as well. I mean, the other, the other thing, um, like the, uh, we were, we were going to publish this book in April. And when this happened, we took the time back to say, how do we just take everything we had written about and apply it? And so we did the addendum around the pandemic. I mean, if you think about it, um, pandemic happens and essentially the entire health system does this student body left, which is we're only going to deal with the pandemic. So if you had a heart condition or if you needed a hip surgery or if you had any other issues, God bless you, you know, come back next year. And and then, you know, in every other industry, when this happens, you're able to sell futures and live afloat. Health systems were literally like, okay, what do we do? We have no revenue and we're all going to go bankrupt. And so, you know, the government has to come bail out. So like the whole system just, it's, it's just so brittle when you think about uh, what we were dealing with. I mean, elderly care, um, you know, it, it, when you think about the infestation zones, they were uh, the nursing homes yeah. and sort of what happened there, you know, it's, I, I, I genuinely believe um, this pandemic, despite the negative connotation is the iPhone moment for the space. Uh, so many ideas that were bumbling along all of a sudden look like there's a great sense of urgency and momentum behind them. Uh, you know, when you think about elderly care, you think about home hospital, you think about uh, mental health workforces and mental health platforms, because a lot of those issues have gotten um, uh, uh, exasperated through this. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, for the entrepreneurs that are listening, I, uh, I can tell you, we actually put up a internal strategy doc about two months ago, where we put up a plan that in the next decade, about 20% of uh, what we're going to do is going to be in this sector. And that's, you know, four to $5 billion of investment, you know, uh, and that's a lot of capital from an early stage perspective in terms of the kinds of projects you can take on. And it comes from the deep belief that a, it's a it's a great moral imperative for the tech sector to take this on, and b, it is going to be uh, one of the biggest, if not, um, uh, you know, value creation opportunities of the next decade as well. Do you think there are any parallels to any other industries in terms of like how important this moment is in the course of healthcare? Like it seems to me that there's been these like just real sea changes that have happened in other industries over time that have created this huge expansion of opportunity. It feels like that moment in healthcare, but I'm curious if you have there are parallels so, that you've so, seen. So uh, I would actually say no, and I'll tell you why. I think most innovation happens from greed, not fear, right? Uh, in terms of iPhone comes along and here's all these fun things we can do. And, and uh, you know, so the social uh, media and entertainment sort of happens. And then you start imagining what could it do, uh, you know, in terms of, we uh, digitally organizing society, content, community, commerce. The, the innovation from fear um, generally doesn't happen because as human beings, we're not programmed to think long-term is, is the issue. So pandemic is uni unique because it became existential in the short term. The place where I thought this might happen, uh, I would say about 15 years ago was in the climate change area where there was this fear, but because you don't feel that right around you on a daily basis when you think about climate change it doesn't really take hold and it doesn't move the hearts and minds of the legislators and the policy makers and, and the entrepreneurs and the capital everything in concert to say we're going to have to change so i i do think this is actually a very unique um uh, moment in time that we're dealing with mm -hmm. um, in in this sector well and then in terms of like it feels very crazy to be prognosticating 10 years out right now with the way that the world is. So let's look a year out. <laughs> what do you think the healthcare industry is going to look like a year, year and a half, two years from now, especially as we, as the vaccines are being introduced and 
things may start to kind of quiet down. What do you think actually happens um, to some of these like huge kind of shifts that have happened in healthcare and with things like telehealth in the past year? Yeah, look, I think, I think the accelerants, um, so the, the adoption of virtual delivery of healthcare, digital delivery of healthcare is a thing. The new normal uh, is not as high as it was in, in, in April, May, but it's, it's multiples higher than this time last year. And, uh, and I think it's gonna compound. And I, and I believe that because we've been working with a bunch of health systems and everybody's thinking about this digital, digital uh, delivery. How do you sort of become a platform? Some of the stuff that Steve Klaske was talking about in terms of healthcare with no address, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing everybody willing to make those investments saying we have to evolve into that. So I think that's, that's legitimate. I would say uh, public health rails, a lot of the work you guys are doing is gonna become core to us. Like every flu season, you don't know what to expect and you're gonna want uh, a, a, a system that can very quickly detect if this is lethal or highly viral, whatever the, the flu season might bring us and, 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 and tackle it. So I, I, I believe infrastructure like the one you guys are building will be an enduring piece of infrastructure that frankly, didn't really exist. I mean, the, the uh, I, you know, you, you pay taxes uh, for the government to do this one thing. And it's in, insane to me how lacking they were in their capability when this I mean, what was CDC was able to do and not able to do and so on. So I think that happens. I do think um, the uh, home hospital area is a legitimate one, bringing care to the home. It's like the, uh, uh, this is where the, uh, uh, hospitals can learn from hospitality. There's like that Airbnb, Airbnb like thinking, right? They just filed to go public yesterday for investors there. So it's top of mind. I think that's sort of an interesting um, uh, core piece of infrastructure that's going to happen. And then the place where we spend a lot of time thinking about is if we're truly going to move towards a world of health assurance, you can't do that without transforming the workforce. So, you know, we're building about 20 companies in the space and some of them are squarely going after how technology brings automation. So any, the biggest uh, workforce in any of these hospitals, you know, this is in the back office doing billing. Mm -hmm. That's a great thing for software to do. And, and frankly, those jobs should go away, but we should take those people and train them to go out in the field and deliver empathetic care. The elderly need to be taken care of. The you know, folks with severe mental illness, there's 8 million of them need to be taken care of. And so I think this workforce transformation in this industry over the next couple of years, uh, we will hopefully start to see that that is also truly taking hold because that to me is an early indicator because to change the outcomes, you have to change the workforces. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we've spent time on uh, thinking through that as well. And like, our, you know, our, our belief here, and I think this is so actually not the way that healthcare has operated historically, but it will have to now because of the capacity of the system is just, you have to enable people to practice at the top of their license. And the things around that, all of those workflows, all of those sort of administrative overhead of, of the system today can be replaced with software. You totally change the efficiency of the system and also just like job satisfaction and the quality of people's work when they're actually able to do the things that so many people come into healthcare for, which is you know interacting with other people and helping and caring for them. Um, so uh, we agree with you on that one. <laughs> um, okay, so maybe I'm uh, kind of shifting back into the entrepreneurial side of things, um, especially today in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, you've talked about where, um, where the kind of focus areas should be from a healthcare perspective. How do you think about entrepreneurs in times of crisis and like how they should be operating today in an extremely dynamic environment where everything is kind of being thrown up in the air again? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the framework we used um, for our uh, CEOs, and we ran a lot of uh, working sessions with them over the last few months, you know, you guys attended some. And it was always about, as I was saying earlier, sort of, you know, take care of the team, play defense, play offense, because as Vincent Churchill says, never, never let a crisis go to waste. I actually think um, the most um, um, sort of acceleration a business can see is in how you respond to uh, crises like these. So I think to that end, um, uh, you know, uh, trying to be um, comprehensive in your understanding of the different stakeholders uh, in terms of culturally what 
what that evolution of the system needs to be and moving towards that, a little bit like what you guys did, which is, hey, you know, we're population health, genomics is interesting, but also handling pandemic, which is sort of a great need and becomes this enduring piece, like we need to add that to our capability, right? So, so I, think, I think businesses that are thinking with that kind of sort of forward-leaning understanding of where this infrastructure needs to head are going to do very, very well. And to me, culturally, that only happens if you have the different stakeholders in your company. You need the people that understand the agility and innovation technology can bring, but also, you know, empathy uh, for the, the stakeholders and, and for the consumers that you're serving, uh, you know, as a business. And how do you how do you really move towards what's needed? You know, it's. I mean, I I, I was looking at this chart the other day. There's probably. 30 to 40, you know, billion plus dollar value companies in this space right now. I think when we look at that chart in like two or three years, that's going to like double or triple. And if you look at that in, in 10 years, I mean, it's going to be, you know, 20, 50 plus billion dollar market cap companies that emerge that have essentially done this digital transformation of healthcare. So I, I, I mean, this is, this is irreversible to me. I, I think it's, it's global and, and, um, and finally, there's there's a sense of urgency to let technology come bring innovation into the space, which has been an issue for a long time, as we as we well know. Yeah, yeah. And on the investor side, I mean, are you in the investment community? Are you seeing money coming in? Like, are are people really trying to make big bets now, and are they interested in the space, or they're kind of waiting and seeing? I I I think the many um, uh, you know senior investors have talked to over the last couple of months, they're all thinking about how do we get into digital health? You know, I mean, there, there's probably eight or 10 firms that have been uh, spending time in this area with sort of enough concentration, but there are many others getting, which is a good thing. I think this is, you know, you're talking about $4 trillion of value that's going to turn hands. Like I, I think we all need to chip in and, and help accelerate that innovation. Yeah, yeah. Um, could I ask a question as well on Teladoc and Livongo this year? That was another big kind of You've had a busy year, um, <laughs> um, and in terms of kind of like where where that space is going, and and how do you see companies like that actually transforming? I mean, because you know that that merger was a big deal in the space. Um, I think actually the biggest deal in the space actually this this year. But what, what does that mean for the future and for those companies? And and where do you see that going and transforming the way people are thinking about their care? Yeah. Um, so just a little bit of a backstory there. Look, I think I think. Um, the choice for the two companies, and, and I, I, had, I had to meet Jason in Detroit because that's the only place we could both uh, show up um, given the pandemic. Um, you know, it was very clear that these two companies were going to either go, going to go right at each other. And uh, the end outcome for that would just be is the insurance companies that win again, or you could actually combine and build a, you know, 35, 40 billion dollar market cap health system that has software like margins. Uh, we thought it was important enough to go create that, that this merger made a lot of sense. Um, I think uh, this has shown a playbook. Uh, I also think this is a platform that now has 70 million uh, plus Americans that are getting primary care and, and you know, millions that are getting chronic care all uh, as a continuum on in sort of single platform. Now they have to go integrate these companies and, and rethink that health assurance experience by combining uh, these two offerings. So there's a lot of work to do there. Um, but I think the vision for what that can be is to me a playbook that others can follow because you know the same thing needs to get done in many other chronic conditions that Livango never got to. Musculoskeletal is an example of that. You know, severe mental disease is another example of that. And then, and then also I think, uh, 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 it also shows uh, a blueprint for sort of how a company ought to be built and how do you, uh, you know, think about working with insurance companies or on a cash pay basis. So Tel uh, Teladoc's got both sort of direct to consumer and, and insured businesses. So, you know, I'm very optimistic. It's going to be, there's going to be many more behind this, yeah. as I said. Yeah, yeah. I, I think they're totally paving the way for something really interesting in the space. Um, Dipti, I'm seeing tons of questions. Should we should we toss it to some other folks for a bit? 
Yeah, yeah, no, th this was great, uh, Hemant and Carolyn. I mean, I guess we could keep on going with this discussion forever, but you're right, there's a lot of questions coming through. And I loved how you, uh, you know, just brought in this question about Teladoc and uh, the Vongo, two companies that could have competed with another, but instead now complement one another and by the merger, it's a brilliant, brilliant move and uh, another way of uh, going forward with healthcare. So um, let's take a look at some of the questions here. We have CEO of Citizen, Anil Sethi, asking a question um, to Hemant, I guess. What's your thesis on patient control data liquidity? You know, data is precious. Everybody wants to own it. Where do you see this going? Uh, is it going to be federated, you know, something different? I have this dream that someday we'll just be able to literally go to the 320 million Americans, whatever the population will be at that time, and just give them all their data and, and flip this model on its head. Uh, and I think, I think the more these consumer experience companies like Color and Livongo, you know, Teladoc um, exist, the easier it's going to get because, you know, this data is, is sitting in systems that are more liquid than the traditional EHRs. I mean, it's, it's sort of interesting when you think about what's happening in the space, because on one side, in the physical health systems world, there's this massive consolidation of the EHRs, right? Epic's kind of taking over all the larger systems. Cerner's got largely the mid-tier, and then there's the fragmentation, but it's all consolidating. On the other side, though, every company, every virtual company that gains scale, like culture has got its own EHR. Livongo's got its own, teldoc has got its own, Mindstrong's got its own. And so there's actually proliferation of these modern uh, EHRs with teams where their business models are much more aligned with empowering the consumer versus creating sort of their closed systems. And, and so the more these companies are successful, the easier that problem is gonna get. And then someday we have to pull it together into here, here's your you know, health dossier and you can activate that wherever you want to procure care on a real-time basis. So patient will own his own portal and then will allow access. That's the dream. Wants to do it. That's I'm the looking dream. forward to that. Here's another question. Subhash Sarkar, when we talk about preventative healthcare, we should have regular screening or diagnostic tests or health checks, et cetera. Is that warranted? If so, will that be something that the providers will introduce as a hygiene? If not, how do you prevent without personalized data? More so, I mean, you know, I'm also seeing these models are very different around the world. What we see in India is very different than here. So how do you see this all panning out? Should we go proactive? Should we do continuous monitoring? Where, where... Oh, I take that. Yeah, I, I think, I. Th I'll state my own personal view of the way that healthcare works today in the US at least, which is because of the payer system, the way it is, we are completely built for acute care, 100% for acute care and not for preventative care. And so the, the, the way we even think about investing in preventative care, there isn't even like a model for that in the US system today that is like well accepted. And, and, and in reality, the, the investments that you can be making in earlier kind of screenings and then basically like the risk stratification that can happen across a population. And this is really like what, what color actually does is, you know, for you to be able to be much more targeted in where you put your interventions at a system level into what groups of the population is really what will make things work much better over the long term and save on costs and improve outcomes. And I think like that, that targeting, it's less from, from our perspective, it's less about even just the individual receiving something that is personalized for them, but really thinking about the system as a whole and where are you placing your resources and being able to use kind of data and technology to understand where those interventions should be targeted over the course of a population's lifetime. Um, and, and we see some changes happening here. I think actually this is another one of our big bets from the, from the, the pandemic is how, how like, you know, systems need to change the way that they manage the health and safety of their population. Um, and target those interventions and those resources accordingly. Yeah, and, and, and it, I think that's spot on, spot on. And the thing about prevention is, this is a little bit like climate change, which is if I do all these things today, then 30 years from now, I'll have less issues, right? And so um, I think creating incentive structures and experiences that get the consumers to do this is where that, that challenge lies. Um, and because um, otherwise, you, you know, uh, we're, we're lazy. Human beings are lazy. We're, we, we don't do preemptive. Pre prevention is not something we would do 
unless you make this a technology problem from an experience and, a, and an incentive perspective. And I think that's what, you know, color has been able to demonstrate. I think it got accelerated because prevention became existential today. Yeah. Uh, and now our hope is that we can learn from this and understand that this could happen any moment. And we really do need to have sort of a prevention system that's always working in background. I think yeah. that's, that's really sort of, if you ask me today versus January of this year, like what's that core piece of infrastructure that's just like suddenly highly urgent, this is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, putting the health back into the hands of the patient and making them responsible, that's the message. Um, also wanted to bring uh, bring up another point, you know, uh, because we have a lot of uh, innovators here in the mix today. You know, your message has to the innovators or the entrepreneurs has always been dream big, but keep it real, right? In your opinion, what is the winning formula for building great companies? And what advice would you have for these startup founders here on creating or building a startup that will last, right? Yeah. So. So I think in, in healthcare, um, I've been in the space for 15, 16 years now, and there was this pattern and you would, you would see technology, uh, there are two kinds of, there are two archetypes. There's a technology founders that'll come and say, hey, I was successful at Facebook or Google and I really wanna do something good for the world and I can use my machine learning or my fancy software and I wanna apply it to health. And the software will just do all the magic and will just transform healthcare. There's like, th that ends up being like, this is like the Silicon Valley episode bastardization of like every presentation, but that's what it looks like when there's like a completely technology angle on a company. And then there is, I'm a physician or I've been in the space for a long time. And I see this one problem, I'm myopically focused on this. And this is how I've hired some software contractors and I'm gonna solve this problem. And because I solved this problem, it'll transform healthcare. That's the other archetype. The reality is they're both completely incomplete. And that's one of the reasons, you know, as Caroline was saying, you know, we were able to create a large outcome in, in the healthcare space because we didn't fall into those traps. From the beginning, I mean, I'll tell you a little story. I, I brought Glenn Tolman to the Bay Area in 2012, and we did a speed dating with like eight tech CEOs doing healthcare. And Glenn, at the end of the day, very politely said to me over dinner, hey, man, that was great, but these are not going to make it. You realize that, right? And I was like, exactly right. But if we can actually bring put together a culture that is truly foundationally healthcare and technology at the beginning, so that you have, have those different stakeholder perspectives. To me, this is diversity. Okay, when we talk about diversity, like that, that kind of sort of a thought process um, that you will build these experiences that fit in that health assurance mindset and actually can scale. And that's my biggest advice, which is from the beginning try to create these interdisciplinary cultures versus, oh, I'm gonna bolt on technology later or I'm gonna bolt on the healthcare perspective later. That that just puts you a step back in, in your ability to succeed. Great, yeah. So think big, uh, think across the whole spectrum and see how you can solve the problems that exist. Another question from Anand Shashadri, could you please share your perspectives on the state of mental health at large today and the most critical areas of change needed. I mean, I think this has brought, COVID has brought this out again, even more so in the open. So what do you suggest? Carolyn, do you want to take that? Or you want me to take that? I can give my two cents and then you should you should give your your, your opinion given given your work in the space. But I think yeah. like, you know, I think our, our view, I think so much about healthcare utilization, including mental health is really about the friction of the process of access. And we, we've seen this in our work on, on, on testing and on population health services, which is to whatever extent you can make things convenient for people and really push it into their daily life, push it to the edges of these communities. I mean, so much of mental health is also affecting actually very similar to what is happening with COVID, which is affecting very under-resourced, traditionally underserved communities. Those are really the areas where utilization of these services is, is often the most difficult. When you change basic things and what it means to, you know, to him out your point around like the, the experience of it, how simple is it to access by just your mobile phone? How private, how convenient, how does it fit into your work day? You know, we've, we've done kind of like clinical genetic testing programs and large population health programs with union populations, for instance. You know, we work with the Teamsters Union on the East Coast and um, this is a population that, you know, half of them didn't even have an email address. Most of them had not been to primary care, a primary care visit, you know, on schedule for the past several years. And 
a lot of that was because they had to take off work, they're single parents, they have, they can't miss, you know, a, they can't take a sick day. And being able to actually receive a clinical service at home that fit in with their schedule and was easily accessible to them and very like kind of friendly in, in the course of, in the context of their life actually totally changed the utilization there. And we wound up having, you know, 10 times the utilization of some other more traditional healthcare services that were really broad based for the Teamsters population. And I think that's exactly the same thing that's confronted a lot of mental health services and actually where a lot of the companies like you're invested in Himan are really trying to change a lot of that access model. Yeah, look, um, this is one of the biggest issues, right? I mean, the digitization, one of the things that's done is created these echo chambers and all kinds of stress, all of it from kids to uh, kids and beyond. And we think it's a massive epidemic. And the biggest issue, in our opinion, is we don't have a measurement system for mental health. So the reason we could build the Vango is because there is blood glucose measurement in the A1C. Mm -hmm. And you can then, based on that, create these sort of digital interventions and physical interventions and whatnot. Mental health was a taboo disease, right? It's not even acknowledged. If you look at the last time there was an interesting medication developed was like 20 years ago. Now there's a bunch coming in the pipeline because folks are starting to recognize this is real. And I think a bunch of um, work still needs to be done. There's, there's about 850 mental health companies. So I'm not encouraging people to go start another one um, unless you had a unique angle. Um, but I do think there's, there's something missing, which is it's all... Um, based on the assumption that if we can intervene and have an empathetic conversation, we'll change the outcome. But we need to measure and have that sort of tune what we're providing. And that doesn't really exist yet. So I think there's a lot of sophistication that needs to be brought into the space over the next, uh, uh, you know, in this sort of next phase of these companies. Some, some kind of a quantitative biomarker that can evaluate the health status of an individual. Exactly right. yeah. Yeah. Someday. Uh, so there's another question here. I know there's a lot of them, uh, but um, uh, so talking about mental health, but there was one that was about investment. And I thought that that would be really right up your alley to him. And as an early, and, and you know, considering the fact that you mentioned earlier on, you know, we have the payers, we have the providers, and then there will be people who pay for your insurance, and then we have the patient, et cetera. Um, as an early stage entrepreneur, this uh, Pankaj Jetwani is asking, how should one look to partner or sell into the providers or the healthcare systems at a time when they're hurting? They, and like you said, the elective procedures have been pushed out, that their money making their jam on their bread and butter, and they're crunched with bandwidth, they're crunched with budgets. How can an early stage uh, entrepreneur position his or her startup so that uh, they can sell their product into the healthcare system. Yeah, you know, um, there's a counterintuitive comment I'll say. We invested in a company in, in a March, right when the pandemic was taking hold. And I remember having this conversation with the founder saying, look, we're, we think this year is gonna be terrible because these health systems are losing money. Uh, they're not going to be able to have budgets to do pilots or, Sort of new things and um but we're behind you okay that was literally this sort of conversation because the founder was just freaking out and um you know it turns out that company beat its plan that they gave us uh before march and and when i reflect on that i think one of the reasons is um hospitals are not going to go away right it's a core foundational uh, pillar of society we need them and because of this lack of resiliency, I think it's been a wake up call in many, many of them that we have to change. So uh, I actually think the, the desire, the courage, the conviction to innovate and set aside resources to do that has actually increased. Just based on, I probably have about 20 data points uh, that are you know, reasonably uh, well-informed. Based on that, I would say that's actually happening. Now, um, that doesn't mean they're going to go do everything because there is a resource constraint as well. So my advice to the founders, as I think about it, is you have to align with what their key priorities are. So this is actually a great time to go on a listening tour and understand how they want to change versus trying to push an idea uphill that you may have had a year ago because all their priorities are upside down. So I think I think like what great founders do, 
uh, you know, stay first principle, then go listen and see how your market has changed to the extent that you're trying to work with these health systems and evolve from there. So another question on the hospital systems is, um, you know, you, you have the payers and then you have the providers, and then you're now seeing uh, more and more models where the payers and the providers are merging. Is that a better model? Is it more efficient? What, what are your thoughts on that? Where do you think we well, should be moving I think forward? Success requires rational economic behavior in the end. Okay. And that means, um, you want to see alignment in that who pays, who decides, who benefits. Going back to the earlier comment, you know, and, and the, the most widely profitable health system is Kaiser, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because they have that complete alignment. So they are, uh, you know, they're not addicted to heads and beds, which is like the, the, the way health systems operate, right? And I think if somebody asked me this once, what's the one um, sort of truism today that just won't make any sense 10 years from now? It's going to be this notion of heads and beds. I think the idea that we're going to be volumetric system uh, going forward a decade from now, I do think that's rapidly changing. And so some of that is happening because the pairs are coming to providers saying, hey, why don't we just run this operation for you? We'll take the risk and we'll do this and, and, and we'll just give you a, a standard sort of operating margin, but let us do the whole thing. Because I think they're looking to figure out how to create the alignment. Health systems are saying, we don't want to be captive to these pairs. Why don't we bring in technology and take risk ourselves so we can do the same thing? So I think there is this, these countervailing forces that are both going towards making this, this uh, industry much more sort of uh, rationally behaved. And that's a, that's a good thing uh, uh, for us. And I think that's, that'll actually move based care on an accelerated basis. And, and India is also moving towards this insurance base. I sometimes wonder whether they're moving backwards into a US model or uh, is their model better off? And how, what do you say to the Indians and those entrepreneurs in India? Healthcare is being revamped there. Uh, what I, I, I think in, go? Just, like, just like in mobile, India has an opportunity to leapfrog. And I think it really should be towards this kind of a preemption system, like what Caroline was saying, right? And sort of building that to keep populations healthy and then an insurance system is just for catastrophic care. Not let the same, uh, you know, not fall into the same trap that happened here. If you look at the history of how uh, insurance uh, developed in, in in the U.S. There's another question here from Hitesh Rastogi, another entrepreneur uh, starting his own company. Diabetes has been one of the most successful application areas for digital health. Could you share your perspectives of problems still unsolved in the cardio metabolic space? Do you see a future where we would have digitally native virtual healthcare providers focusing primarily on chronic conditions like diabetes end to end? Caroline, that's a tough question. That's a good one for you. <laughs> I was gonna say, I think this sounds a little bit like Teladoc and Livongo, but um, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we do see a future where where that will happen. Um, no, I think um, I. I th I think again, like the, the to me, one of the things, and, and color focuses a lot on this, and this is particularly because of of the acute public health situation that we're in here. To me, is really also around equity in these models and around access across very diverse populations. And I think that that again, like, is something that it's so interesting to me seeing. We, we sit in these conversations with public health leaders all over the country every day now, and we'll show them our product. <laughs> We'll show. We'll, we'll walk through exactly how things work, and the questions are always around. Well, is is you know is software is the software component of this is the fact that they need to use a mobile phone actually a barrier rather than an enabler? And like we just time and time again, especially in the U.S., we see it 100% as an enabler. Where if you have to call somebody and wait for an hour on a phone to get an appointment, it it completely changes how access happens. And I think that's one of the things as it relates to, you know, exactly this question, like digitally native kind of virtual healthcare providers. I think this is the key enabler of healthcare utilization from an equity perspective, not the barrier. Um, and I think that that's also something that's gonna change and shift in this model where public health, you know, uh, leaders and sort of healthcare leaders are starting to see that you actually can transform uptake and utilization through technology. Um, and particularly in these areas where ongoing engagement, ongoing sort of connection with people is critical to the care management broadly. That's what's going to be really the, at the core of it. Yeah. And then, by the way, the question is spot on. So like at, at uh, uh, Livongo, we used to talk a lot about what is going to be the second center of gravity 
if, if diabetes was the one where we took the diabetic persona and then were solving for their comorbidities, hypertension, weight loss, and whatnot, cardiometabolic is a standalone category. And uh, there hasn't been enough uh, uh, work done uh, in terms of redefining that experience that's like really scales. So it, it is an open area that um, has good opportunity. Again, two areas, diabetes, hypertension, cardiometabolic, uh, all areas where India has a lot of issues with the that we need to worry about. You know, again, going back last hundred years, we've been all scaling up, scaling up. We've got hospital systems where we had like, you know, fa family doctors, we have banks where we used to have other options. And then also we have schools, which... Um, Again, mass produces, uh, you know, education is mass. Uh, and now we're going back from, uh, you know, treating the masses to treating back to individuals. These systems are breaking down, right? They're not fulfilling the needs of society today. And you are talking about this whole paradigm shift, right? And all it needs is a trigger, a, a powerful trigger. Where do you see the trigger is? Is COVID the trigger for healthcare to make the shift or do we need a, more powerful trigger to see this shift back to the old way of things, but better with technology. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do believe uh, this goes back to my point of, uh, you know, COVID being akin to the iPhone moment. That's really what I, what I mean. I mean, I think you're, what's happened as we have organized uh, humans digitally, content, community, commerce, uh, we we're going from this era of mass production to mass personalization. And that's the whole thesis behind the first book around uh, unscaling. And, and I think COVID does exactly that because what, 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 is, what is color doing? You, you now have a, a way to uh, take an entire population and at an individual level, make sure you can keep them healthy. That's mass personalization, right? At an individual level, you can see if uh, they have propensity for certain kinds of diseases because of the gen genomic construct or, or see if their uh, you know, social determinants of health might lead them a certain way or see if they're likely to get COVID if they have gotten COVID or they might be spreading to, right? So, so I think sort of, I'm just sort of saying different use cases so that you can literally take those rails and keep people healthy at, an, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a single person level. I think that is the paradigm shift that uh, technology enables over the next decade, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to bend the cost curve. I mean, like we, we need, we need to do this if it's going to be affordable. Care is coming back to the home as opposed to you going to the hospital, you're going to see more and more of it moving the other right. way. Around. I know we are running out of time and I know Hemant has a hard stop at 8.30 getting into another meeting. So here's the last question for two of you. Uh, and this is a very futuristic question. What are the biggest problem in healthcare, in your opinion? And where do you think we will be in 10 years from now? Caroline? Caroline, me? <laughs> All you. <laughs> I think the biggest problem is this misalignment. Um, if you uh, create the economic alignment uh, and decisions across the board. There's no silver bullet in healthcare. Decisions across the board get made with that rational economic behavior. Then the consumers are going to demand that I want the same experience when I go purchase a book at Amazon uh, and how I procure healthcare. Or I want the same understanding of my body that Jiffy Lube has when I go take my car for an inspection and they do a 28,000 point inspection or whatever that is when i get my physical they kind of touch me in four spots and touch my blood pressure and say you're okay and this is a much more complicated vehicle right and so so i think that to me is uh ultimately what needs to happen uh so that the consumer gets empowered to make rational decisions and what once that happens like every other industry i think this model will tip well uh carolyn do you want to add anything to that Completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. Ms. No. Ms. <laughs> it was all exposed this year in particular. And, and yeah, I, I agree that I think that that's going to be the, the biggest thing and, and that a lot of companies are, are driving at trying to fix. And I think a lot of that innovation is going to come from the private sector, candidly. Like we can't wait for governments to act here. It's, it's going to have to come from, from, I think, a lot of the work that 
folks that come out and his companies are doing. <laughs> Bringing the patient back to the center of the whole equation is what we're hearing. And so there you go, startups uh, that are creating solutions. Uh, maybe you know who your target audience is and who you should be catering to. But thank you again, Hemant, for this really very informative session. Thank you, Carolyn. You did an outstanding job with the conversation and also bringing to life uh, your own company, Color, which is uh, doing some interesting work and has pivoted with COVID and creating these testing sites all over the country. So great to hear from you. Great to hear from you, Hemant. Thank you very much. And thank you, for Thai Global and Thai Global Health for uh, the session. We look forward to more sessions in the future. We have a global summit coming up December 8, 9, 10. That's going to be virtual in India. The, us looking for investors and startups to uh, present, the startups to present their innovative solutions and investors to give feedback to these startups. So if this is of interest to you, write to Thai, Thai Global Health and uh, they'll put you in touch with the right people. Thanks again, Heyman. Thank Caroline and thank, thank you, audience. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.